at verses 23 through 34. Our text will be verse 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Father, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you today and thank you for all you've done for us. May we receive your truth today and may we our lives be forever changed. We thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. This verse establishes the Lord's Supper as ordained by the Lord and for being for the saved. And the practice and observance of the Lord's Supper is to be done in a biblical way as laid out in these scriptures. And Paul is writing to correct and set in order the observance of this service. So in this church, the service had lost its meaning by the way it was being done. In verses 20, 21, and 22, and I've got to give a little background before I get to the main part. In verses 20, 21, and 22, in the days following Pentecost, the practice of a meal and the Lord's Supper were combined. You can see that in Acts 2.42, 20, 20, verse 7, 27, 35. And then he says in verse 20, Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So they were meeting together, carrying out this, the, the way it had, had evolved, and he said, You're not doing the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? And he said in this, I will not praise you. In other words, the rich had plenty, the poor had little, and some had nothing. And verse 21 indicates that some ate without waiting on the poor to arrive. She said, one taketh before another, the rich before the poor, who had no supper of their own, instead of tearing one for another. Look in verse 33. He said, Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another, and he's talking about eating the Lord's Supper and not the meal. So every believer in Christ has a ministry and a purpose and a place. And so that's being brought out here. If you look over in chapter 12, verse 21, I, I believe that's the precept for what he says here in chapter 12, verse 21. He says, And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you, verse 25, that there should be no schisms in the body, but that each member should have the same care one for another. And that's the way it is in the body of Christ. So are you afoot? Well, that means you should be walking for the Lord. Are you a hand? That means you ought to be serving the Lord. Are you an ear? That means you ought to be hearing what the Lord, and on and on you can go. But if you look at verse 23, you see Paul's authority for what he said. He said, for I have received of the Lord, speaking of Christ, I have received of the Lord, that which also I delivered unto you. So he had already told them previously about this and they hadn't complied with it. And so he said, you know, I praise you in some things, but in this, he said, no. He said, you're wrong. And if you look in verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped. Well, when he had supped, he's talking about the, the, the bread and the cup, which was done after the meal, that was the way it was laid out uh, to be done. 
So he said, I have received my instructions from the Lord. So Paul saw the Lord, and then Paul heard from the Lord and received uh, these instructions. Uh, I think in seeing the, Lord, or seeing the Lord was what qualified him away to be an apostle. Uh, you, can, you can go back to uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse, verse number 12, and also uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4. So the Lord's Supper is, is the Lord's institution and not Paul's invention. Now, something else we ought to think about, and that is that the, this letter, 1 Corinthians, was the first recorded words of Christ uh, that was recorded even before uh, the Gospels. This, this was written before then. And you can kind of see how important it was in Paul's laying it out. So what we need to do is we listen to what Paul is saying here and then we observe the Lord's Supper in the manner that he received from the Lord as best we can in, in, in light of those instructions. Then if you look at verse 23, it's amazing to me. He said, For I have received of the Lord, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. You know, I think about him. He faced his betrayer that night. And he was to face that night the angry mob, desertion by most of his disciples. He was to face their so-called trial. He was to face a severe scourging beating that which a normal person would have died. But no man could take his life. He gave it. He had to face the road to Calvary, his death on the cross, taking the nailing to the cross, being made sin for us, but yet he thought of his disciples and of us down through time, even to this very hour this morning, because it said, and when he had given thanks, he break it, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. All that facing him, but see where his heart was. See the strength of him, our Savior. He said in verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he break it, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So this morning I want us to remember his suffering. It's a, I think a personal remembrance because he's a personal savior. He died for you and me as if we were the only person alive. And so that just really translates that if you were here as the only one here on this earth, he would have still come and done what he did. So we remember his suffering. And when I read or hear of his body broken, and I'm not speaking of the bones because his bones were not broken, but his joints were out of his bones were out of joint. Yeah, I, I believe that's what it says in Psalm 22. You think about the cross being dropped in the hole. Uh, you think about when they extended his arms out on the cross to nail him to the cross. There's no way to even imagine all that he did. When I think of him being made for sin for me, carrying the weight of the cross, the judgment of God that I deserve, Psalm 22 says, But I am a worm, a no man, a reproach of men, and despise of the people. And all they that see me laugh me to scorn, they shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he should deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delights in him. 
Yeah, we ought to remember his suffering. No way to describe it. And then we ought to remember his shedding of his own blood. Look in verse 25 and 26. He said, after the same manner also, he took the cup in the New Testament. This cup in the New Testament is my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death till he comes. He shed blood for us. He shed blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke twenty two forty four says, In being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. No doubt he shed blood in his scourging. As I think about it, I don't know this, but I think about it. He was close to bleeding to death in the scourging. He shed blood when they nailed him to the cross, when they pierced his side. We ought to remember he shed his blood. He gave his life. The Bible says this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show forth the Lord's death till he comes. It is his blood often remind, being reminded when you read in the book of Hebrews, he talks about his blood. He said, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into a holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And then we come to verse 27. And he says we're to examine ourselves. He said, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread, and drank this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So I think you have to read both of those verses together when you examine uh, yourself. And Verse 29 says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So he says we are to examine ourselves before we partake. We don't examine ourselves not to partake. We examine ourselves before we partake. That's what he says in verse 28, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, partake of the bread and of the cup. So examine just simply means to approve, to approve. Uh, you prove in view of to approve. Uh, you want to approve, uh, in other words, to have in your life what the Lord approves of for you to have in your life is what he's saying. So you prove, you examine yourself to approve the things in your life that the Lord would desire you to have into your life. And that means confession of sin. Uh, that means confession of where we are to where we ought to be. Now look at Romans 12, verse 2. Romans 12, verse 2. And I, I want you to turn there because when you look at that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, that's not three wills. He's just saying that his will is good, it is acceptable, and it's perfect. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that's what he's talking about when we examine ourselves. 
Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God, that you may prove what the will of God is and that it is good, acceptable, and perfect. The will of God, all three adjectives describe his will. Examining yourself is discerning the Lord's body. Verse 29 says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now the word damnation, remember I read, and I did it purposely, verse 32, that sets the fact that the Lord's Supper is for the saved. He's, and so damnation is not the damnation of condemnation because we are a child of God. He's talking about the chastening hand of God. He's talking about the, the temporary chastening or judgment that God might bring in your life in order to get you to where you should be when you read the Word of God. And we read the Word of God, sometimes we don't hear it. And if we don't hear what He says, then He gets our attention. That's what He's talking about. The damnation is not the judgment of the condemnation of the unsaved. And then discerning the Lord's body we need to discern our body in the light of his body, distinguishing between what we are and what we ought to be. He says, do you not know you are not your own? I think we need a transformation from ownership to servanthood. We literally do not own anything. He owns everything. Even the body in which our spirit lives belongs to him. He said if you're a child of God, he said, what? Do you not know that you're not your own because you're bought with a price? And so in the Lord's Supper, we're evaluating the price that he paid for our bodies. We belong to him. And so if we have allowed something in our body that, in our life that shouldn't be, he said, examine yourself in light of that and examine yourself in light to approve of what needs to be done in your life, that which the Lord brings forth. You say, Lord, I realize this is wrong. I need to be right with you. I confess that, and I'm going to approve that in my life and to have that in my life. That's how we are to look at the Lord's service. And I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verses 19 through 20. Uh, just as a reference. We don't own our bodies. We belong to the Lord not only by creation but by redemption. Redemption is being redeemed. So redeemed is what? Redeemed is buying back. So we lost our value when we sinned. And the Lord redeemed us. In other words, he reset our value. Isn't he wonderful? Amen. He reset our value. We're valuable in his sight. You belong to the Lord. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Amen. And so that's how we ought to view our life, our bodies, and that's what the Lord's Supper is allowing us to do, is to remember Him, is to uh, let us examine ourselves to see where we are, to where we ought to be, and then to confess what needs to be confessed, and then to partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, the warning is, is to us that if we fail to judge our body, he will. If we fail to judge ourself, he will. Now look what he says. And, and, and I believe that the, in verse 29, not discerning the Lord's body is speaking about his body and your body. Since our body belongs to him, we, we discern our body in light of his body and what he did for us and where we ought to be in our body since we don't own our bodies he does he owns everything so we change our mindset from thinking of ownership that I own to servanthood because he owns everything and we ought to view his ownership uh, in our life now verse 30 says for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep for if we would judge ourselves, we should be what? Not be judged. Not be judged by who? By, judged by the Lord. But when we are judged, we're what? Chastened of the Lord 
that we should not be what? Condemned with the world. Again, the Lord's Supper is made for the child of God. Uh, and it's allowing us to remember him. And it's allowing us to examine ourselves. And it's allowing us to approve in our life what we ought to approve, what God has given us in his word. We have a wonderful Savior. Self-judging is done with a view to correction. It's me coming to approve in my life what God approves of. It is you determining by the Lord where you are in the light of where you should be. And so this is our opportunity to remember Christ and what he did for us in the suffering of his body and in the shedding of of his blood and examining ourselves. So I want us to bow for a moment of prayer. In this moment of prayer, we can remember our Savior, his sacrifice, his blood, and then to examine ourselves and then to handle whatever the Lord needs to handle. <coughs> And I ask our pianist to come and play softly something while we're taking these few moments. It's important few moments in our life.